Hi and welcome to Global Studies with Ms. Pritchard. This video is for Global 1 students. It will cover the early empires in India and China from 330 BC to 550 AD. All right, the first thing we need to talk about is the Mauryan Empire. This is in India. It is founded by Chandragupta Maurya around 321 BC. He is a ruthless leader that uses spies and military powers to gain control and keep control. Um, you can probably remember from our earlier studies of empires that leaders who work that way do not tend to stay in power very long, and overall that tends to weaken your empire because the people get angry and they're willing to unite and fight against you. Um, however, we have Ahsoka who becomes emperor in 269 BC. He rules during the Golden Age of the Mauryan Empire. And it is after the Battle of Kalinga, as he is looking at the blood-soaked battlefield littered with bodies and dead people, that he becomes a devout Buddhist. And he rules with the belief of peace to all beings. That is when he establishes a policy of religious toleration. He also builds an extensive road system with wells and rest houses every nine miles. This improves communication and trade. And it is after his death in 232 BC that the empire starts to fall apart. Then we have the Gupta Empire. Chandragupta establishes the Second Empire in 320 AD. Now, Chandragupta may, gets his power by marrying into a powerful royal family. And the Gupta Empire is the golden age of ancient India, and that is, they have tons of achievements in the arts and religious philosophy and the sciences. Um, the Gupta Empire maintains its power and wealth through trade with the Mediterranean world and Keep in mind, the Gupta Empire is increasing their power as the Roman Empire power is declining. Uh, the empire begins to fall apart after Chandragupta II dies, and the invading tribes are pushed west by the Mongols. So as the Mongols are conquering their empire, they're pushing everybody, and it's basically like this mini tidal wave that will hit all the way to Rome. All right, cultural diffusion. We see that with the Buddhism and Hinduism. Buddhism spreads throughout Asia through trade and conquest of the Indian empires, and it divides into two different forms. The Mahayana gets the newer teachings. They tend to worship Buddha as a god, and anybody can become a Buddha and be known as a bodh bodhisattvas, and they focus on good works. Then you have the Theravada, which follow the stricter original teachings of Buddha. Because remember, Buddha's original teachings are a belief system, not a religion. So the Mahayana version turns Buddhism into a religion. Uh, you can also see that Buddhist art flourishes and spreads throughout Asia. Uh, there are plenty of sculptures and architecture that looks at that, that we will see later in this lecture. Hinduism, with the development of the monotheistic religions of Judaism and Christianity, Hinduism evolves and it begins to change. So in this instance, we see the impact of cultural diffusion within something instead of it spreading out. So it's the monotheistic idea that has Hinduism focusing on its three main gods, Brahma the creator, Vishnu the preserver, and Shiva the destroyer. And the goal is to achieve balance among all three of those gods. All right, here you can see images of the Bamiyan Buddhas, and they are giant sculptures that stood in Afghanistan for centuries until the Taliban destroyed them in March of 2001. That is six months before the 9-11 attacks. All right, cultural achievements. We'll start with literature and the performing arts. Kalidasa is a famous playwright, and the plays are still used today. There are also several collections of poetry from the time. 
and troops of actors traveled throughout the empire performing combinations of drama and dancing, and you can still see that in a lot of Bollywood movies. Um, perhaps I will show one after school for extra credit or clips during lunch. All right, their achievements in math and science. Well, their astronomers proved that the Earth was round by using observations of shadows on the moon. They also gave us our modern numerals, one, two, three, four, the concept of zero, and the decimal system. Their mathematician, Aribata, calculated pi to 3.1415 and the solar year to 365.3586805 days. So that's pretty accurate. It's down to like the nanosecond there. They also compiled medical texts that described over 1,000 diseases and 500 medicinal plants. They also performed surgery, including plastic surgery. All right, trade. They had the Silk Roads, which are overland routes from China to the Mediterranean, and they stretch across Asia, passing through India. So that is how a lot of the knowledge from India spreads to the rest of the world. And in fact, you might notice that we call the numerals that we just talked about Arabic numerals, and that is because it was the Arab traders who brought them to the Europeans, so the Arabs got credit for what the Indians developed. Sea trade. The Indians did trade with Rome, African kingdoms, and China. So it was international, and what you need to know is that the Indian Ocean is actually the the basin of wealth for the world, and whoever controls that region tends to control the prosperity of the world. All right, so the effects that we see from this trade. Trade allows the Indian economy to prosper. Merchants move to other areas, taking their culture with them, and you see that especially strong influence in Southeast Asia, Cambodia, and Thailand being the easiest examples to describe. And the religious beliefs spread. There are larger Buddhist populations in East Asia than in India. All right, and here is the Buddhist influence in Southeast Asia. Angkor Wat is a Buddhist temple in Cambodia, and it is the largest religious complex in the world. Um, you can see the whole image in the bottom left, and then there are some close-ups to give you an idea of the size and the detail involved in the temple complex. All right, China. Li Bang is the first Han emperor, and he centralizes the government and lowers taxes, and he moves away from legalism. Emperor Wudi expands the empire to almost the same size as present-day China, also establishes the civil service. Government employees are chosen on merit or on test scores instead of family connections. So that actually allows some social mobility, although keep in mind it was really only those rich families that could afford to send their boys to school. And you had to be relatively wealthy to sit for the multiple days of testing and have servants to take care of you during those days. Because... You sat in a little tiny box taking a test for like nine days straight. Um, so you guys think your exams are bad? That is even worse. All right, and this is where Confucianism becomes the foundation of Chinese government. And it had already been the basis of much of Chinese society because Confucius took the values of the Chinese society and that is how he developed his philosophy. All right, Chinese culture, the technology, they developed a lot of stuff that we still use today. Paper, which makes books cheaper and therefore increases education. The collar harness for horses makes it easier to pull a plow and therefore increases your agricultural abilities. And if you have more food, you can have more people. The two-blade plow, same impact wheelbarrow for moving objects and dirt and once again makes farming much easier water mill um, allows you to power more machi simple machines and they have the silk monopoly that is until we get the Byzantine monks that steal the silkworms but that's a few centuries off still 
And in Chinese culture, you are encouraged to assimilate. And assimilation means that they encourage people to marry with different cultural groups. And this is what allows the Chinese culture to remain dominant because they have people marrying in. So any of the foreign cultures tend to be minimized while the Chinese culture gets stronger. All right, the Han Dynasty also has some problems. There is a wealth gap. The rich get richer while the poor get poorer. And this weakens the economy of the Han Dynasty. And then you have a flood in 11 AD, which leaves many dead and starving. And remember, starving people are willing to rebel, which is what happens. Many groups oppose the government policies and the emperor gets overthrown. All right, so show me your notes for credit. If you show them before the deadline, you get bonus points.